drawing galvanic cell images, like the one you see on the right-hand side of this slide, is fairly complicated. We have to worry about the structure of each electrode in terms of the metal solid and any metal cations. We have to draw in the salt bridge, which is in black here, and the wire connecting the two electrodes, which I've drawn here in pink. It would be helpful to have a shorthand method to describe a galvanic cell in fully textual form so that we can easily communicate to someone the type of cell we're working with. This is the purpose of cell notation, which you may also hear referred to as a cell diagram or line notation, and it's a shorthand method of describing a galvanic cell. To ensure that the notation communicates something unambiguous, certain conventions are used, and you'll want to pay attention to these as we go through the rules for cell notation. So, the first overarching rule is that in cell notation, the anode is always written first, followed by the salt bridge in the middle, and we'll see there are special designations for the salt bridge and a couple of other special points in the galvanic cell. And the cathode is always written last. Here, I've set it up so that the image is consistent with this, with the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. However, you may not necessarily see this in an image of a galvanic cell. We'll talk a little bit later about how to use standard reduction potentials to predict what the cathode and anode are. For now, take my word for it that the zinc, zinc 2 plus electrode is the anode, and the copper, copper 2 plus electrode is the cathode. Each electrode is represented using the components and their phases within that electrode, and the reactants are always written on the left. In this case, since the anode involves zinc metal and zinc 2 plus, and oxidation occurs at the anode, we start by writing zinc solid, since it's a reactant. Now, within this electrode, there's a phase boundary between the zinc metal and the aqueous solution of Zn2 plus ions. And to represent that in cell notation, we use a vertical line. This is the pipe character you may have heard in other contexts. That zinc solid is in contact with zinc 2 plus at a phase boundary, which is aqueous. To represent the salt bridge, we use two vertical lines like this. And if additional salt is present in the salt bridge, say something like potassium nitrate, KNO3, we generally don't represent that in the cell notation since it's irrelevant to the thermodynamics of the cell. For the cathode, we do something similar, again following the rule that the reactants appear first. Reduction occurs at the cathode, and so Cu2 plus is included first. It's aqueous. It's the aqueous solution over here in the cathode. And again, there's a phase boundary between the copper solid and the copper 2 plus aqueous solution, and so we use another green line to represent that. And finally, the ultimate product of reduction at the cathode is copper solid, and that's included last. So keep in mind that we use a vertical line to represent a phase boundary between two components within an electrode, and do note that there may be more than one phase boundary within an electrode. For example, if an inert electrode is used, and the redox reaction, the, uh, the half reaction, takes place completely in aqueous solution, for example. And the salt bridge is always represented with two adjacent vertical lines, like so. We always write cell notation in the form anode bridge cathode, and this has a convenient effect on the direction of electron flow within the notation. We can always imagine electrons flowing from left to right through the cell notation. That is, from the reducing agent on the left-hand side to the oxidizing agent on the right-hand side of the cell notation. And notice that the electron transfer here is between the reactants, right? So zinc is transferring two electrons to copper 2 plus, which is why I've linked the reactants here. But what we can say in general is that electrons will always flow from left to right from the anode to the cathode in cell notation. What this also allows us to do is immediately write a balanced redox reaction for the process occurring within the gal galvanic cell. Reactants always appear first, and so we can immediately write on the reactant side zinc solid and aqueous copper 2 plus. What's interesting about this is even though the zinc solid and the copper 2 plus are not directly sitting in the same beaker, the redox process happens across the wire as electrons are transferred across it, right? So it makes sense then that one reactant should be in one electrode and the other reactant should be in the other electrode. The products here will just be what's on the right-hand side within each electrode, so Zn2 plus aqueous ions and copper solid, which plates out onto the copper within the anode. One final thing that's worth noting here is that if concentrations are not listed, 
we assume that we're under standard conditions, that is, one mole per liter of all aqueous species, in this case the copper 2 plus and the zinc 2 plus. Whenever we're not under standard conditions, we need to indicate the concentrations of aqueous species. So, say for example, we were working with a cell that contained within its anode, let's say, zinc solid and 0.1 molar Zn2+, which is non-standard conditions. To indicate the concentration, we just put that concentration in parentheses after the species and its phase, like so. From here, we could continue on and use the double line to represent the salt bridge, and so on and so forth. We can also write cell notation not from an image of a galvanic cell, but from a chemical equation for the redox reaction that occurs within the cell. A nice way to do this involves, first of all, identifying the half reactions that are going on, and specifically identifying which is an oxidation and which a reduction, right? So what we can see here is that copper solid is going to copper 2 plus, aqueous ions, and two electrons will be released, while on the reduction side we have two Ag plus ions in aqueous solution combining with two electrons to form two moles of Ag solid. To write the cell diagram, we've got to recognize that this is an oxidation, while the process involving silver is a reduction, and also that oxidation occurs in the anode, remember anox, and reduction occurs in the cathode, red cat, and so we can now position each of the half reactions and half cells within the cell notation. We know that the copper, copper 2 plus couple needs to come first, and copper is going to be a reactant. In fact, we can see that right here. And so we can begin the cell notation just with copper solid. Now, no information is given about concentrations here, so we're going to assume we're under standard conditions here with one mole per liter of all species involved. The reason we need to specify that, by the way, is because that's going to influence the cell voltage. We'll talk more about that in a future video and in, in future discussions. There's going to be a phase boundary between the copper solid and the copper 2 plus aqueous ions, and then we'll have a salt bridge, always appears in the middle. The salt bridge links the two electrodes, or half cells. The reactant within the reduction process is silver plus. We don't need to incorporate the two into this. That's actually implied based on the uh, reactants in the cell notation. At any rate, Ag plus is an aqueous solution, and the product of reduction is silver solid and here's our cell notation. So we can immediately identify, for example, that in the course of the redox reaction, copper transfers electrons to silver plus, and not only that, but just based on the fact that copper goes to copper 2 plus and silver plus goes to silver, we can identify that two electrons are transferred. From this cell notation, we can also work backwards to the balanced chemical equation if we didn't have it in hand, and identify the oxidizing agent and reducing agent within this galvanic cell. While we're on the topic of cell notation, it's worth considering half cells in which the entire redox reaction is aqueous. This is a great example. Cerium 4 plus can pick up an electron to form cerium 3 plus. In that case, if there's no phase boundary between the species, we use a comma to separate them within the cell notation rather than a vertical line because they're not separated by a phase boundary, right? They're both aqueous. The question is, if there's no metal solid present, then how do we actually transfer the electrons. Let's think about how this has to work physically. Cerium 4 plus and cerium 3 plus are both aqueous, which means they're both going to be in aqueous solution. As cerium 4 plus gains electrons, it's going to form cerium 3 plus, which is also aqueous. But the electrons have to come from somewhere, right? And that's going to involve a wire that's going to transfer electrons into this solution that cerium 4 plus can combine with, essentially, right? We do want to incorporate this so-called inert electrode into our cell notation. Just because if someone were to go and try to reconstruct this cell, they would need to know what material that inert electrode was made out of. There is a phase boundary between the inert electrode and the aqueous solution, and we want to account for that in our cell notation. And so, to write the cell notation for this half cell, we would include the CE4 plus and the CE3 plus with a comma separating them like so, and then we would use a vertical bar to indicate the phase boundary, and we would write the composition of the inert electrode immediately after that. For example, platinum metal is a common choice, and we could write PT 
solid to indicate that the inert electrode is made of platinum metal.